Our Old Testament reading today is from 2 Kings, chapter 25, verses 1 to 12. Now in the ninth year of his reign, on the tenth day of the tenth month, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came with all of his army against Jerusalem, and camped against it, and built a siege wall all around it. And so the city was under siege until the eleventh year of King Zedekiah, And on the ninth day of the fourth month, the famine was so severe in the city that there was no food for the people of the land. And then the city was broken into, and all the men of war fled by night by way of the gate between the two walls besides the king's garden. Through the Chaldeans were all around the city, and they went by way of the Arabah. But the army of the Chaldeans pursued the king and overtook him in the plains of Jericho, and all his army was scattered from him. And then they captured the king and brought him to the king of Babylon at Riblah. And he passed sentence on him. And they slaughtered the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes, and then put out the eyes of Zedekiah, and bound him with bronze fetters, and brought him to Babylon. Now on the seventh day of the fifth month, which was the nineteenth year of King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the guard, a servant of the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem, and he burned the house of the Lord, the king's house, and all the houses of Jerusalem. Even every great house he burned with fire. So all the army of the Chaldeans who were with the captain of the guard broke down the wall around Jerusalem. Then the rest of the people who were left in the city and the deserters who had deserted the king of Bab- to the king of Babylon and the rest of the people, Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, carried away into exile. But the captain of the guard left some of the poorest of the land to be vine dressers and plowmen. You know, the worship program that we're doing right now, the story, was developed by Christian pastor and author Max Lucado, along with another pastor, a guy named Randy Frazee. Randy Frazee wrote one of the books that's a companion to, a companion resource to the story called The Heart of the Story. And in this book, Randy Frazee talks about one morning, he was watching one of the morning shows on TV while he was eating breakfast, and he noticed that they were doing this spot on George Washington and on his descendants and where they were. And he was shocked because they did a spot on one family and it happened to be a family that was in his church. And the son of this family was really good friends with his son and he never knew that this family was related to George Washington, the first president of the United States. Frazee says he just about choked on his Cheerios. It's kind of funny. Well, Frazee goes on to say, that George Washington was actually offered the privilege of being the king of the United States, but he turned it down. Because you see, Washington's view, like the view of many of the founding fathers, was that there should be no king in the United States except King Jesus. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. Today we're going to see that the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah didn't acknowledge their one true king, the Holy One of Israel, God, the one that they knew but didn't acknowledge. And they suffered greatly for that mistake. But we also find in these ideas, in this passage, that there's an eternal hope because of the kingdom of God that is ruled by King Jesus. Today we're going to see that kingdoms fall and thy kingdom come. We're going to start by taking a look at the fall of the two kingdoms, and then we're going to see that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And finally, we're going to see what that has to do with our own little corner of the kingdom, right here at the intersection of Stones Stones Crossing and 135. Because we find that it's a blessing to obediently serve the king. Well, you remember a couple of weeks ago when the weather was worse than it is this morning. I know it was pretty, pretty bad out this morning, too. 
but a couple of weeks ago, it was so bad we had to cancel church, if you remember that. And that put us a week behind with the story. And we thought that since the account of the fall of the northern kingdom and the fall of the southern kingdom were so close together that we just combine those two and kind of get caught up a little bit this morning. Because if we don't, we're going to find ourselves on Easter Sunday looking at something else. So this morning, we're going to spend a little bit of time uh, combining and catching up. As we continue with the story this morning, we're going to start by looking at the fall of the two kingdoms. The first kingdom to fall was the northern kingdom of Israel. Its capital was in Samaria, the city of Samaria. And last week we talked about how God had sent His messengers, the prophets, to both Israel and Judah to turn their hearts back to the Lord. Prophets like Elijah that we focused on last week, and, and a, a guy that I guess you could consider his disciple, a guy named Elisha. Also, a couple other prophets like Hosea and Amos were two, pro, two other prophets that God sent to the northern kingdom of Israel to try to draw them back. Well, as we saw last week, for a time, under the leadership of Elijah the prophet, the people did turn back to God. And God had mercy on the kingdom of Israel, and He didn't destroy them at that point in time. But the generational problem that Israel faced was a problem of spiritual adultery. They were idol worshipers. They worshipped idols, and they worshipped other gods besides the one true God something that God had commanded them not to do in the law of Moses. What's more, as they worship these false gods like Baal and Ashtra, there was a righteous remnant that followed people like Elijah and did not worship the false gods. But throughout most of the history of Israel, most of the people and most of the time committed idolatry and worshipped the false gods. What's more, the nation of Israel had a string of 19 kings. 19 kings that were evil or wicked. And so the leadership of the kingdom of Israel totally drifted away from God and took the rest of the nation with them. Well, they didn't obey God, and they did not demand the people obey God. So the northern kingdom failed to do what God had called them to do. They failed to return to God, and they failed to show God to the other nations around them. They failed to be obedient to Him. And in fact, what they did was even a little bit worse than that because what they showed the other nations was that they were just like everybody else. They were no different. And God had called them to be different. And they didn't do it. Well, the result of that was that God let them go. He let them follow their own path. And in the year 721 BC, the Assyrian army conquered the northern kingdom of Israel and took the people off into captivity, scattered them all around the Middle East, and for all intents and purposes, the ten tribes of the northern kingdom ceased to exist. Well, the fate of the southern kingdom of Judah was the same, except it took longer. Judah had the same problem. They too worshipped false gods. They had turned away from God. They would committed spiritual adultery. They had worshipped idols. And they did not follow God. God sent prophets to Judah as well. Prophets maybe that are a little more famous. Guys like Jeremiah and Isaiah, whose name and fame echo down through history and who are quite well known to us even today. Well, unlike the kings of the northern kingdom, some of the kings in the southern kingdom did worship God. Kings like Hezekiah and Josiah. These men worshiped God, and they, they were able to take the people with them and, and convince the people to follow the one true God at different points in the history of Judah for a short period of time. They also closed down some of the places of idol worship throughout the land. And because of these good kings... The nation of Judah worshipped the one true God at different points during their history. But, like Israel, Judah was eventually conquered. 600 years before the birth of Jesus, the Babylonian Empire, the Babylonian army, as we, as we read in our Old Testament reading, conquered Judah, captured Jerusalem, burned it, 
and deported all of the people back to Babylon to captivity. But God's upper story continued. You see, God preserved for himself a righteous remnant. People from the kingdom of Judah who were committed to worshiping him, despite the horrors of conquest and deportation and captivity. It was the lower story of these people that connected to the upper story of God as they worshiped God. And this, this thread of faithfulness existed and continued through their history. And it was through that thread of faithfulness that the line of the Messiah was born. It's a blessing to us to obediently serve the King. And as we look at the Messiah, and we see the advent, the birth of the Messiah, Jesus Christ, that we celebrated just a few short, month, short months ago, we see that the next step is we hear the Messiah, we hear his, his followers tell us that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In the New Testament, John the Baptist proclaimed the message that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And when Jesus started his ministry, that was the same message he had, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Meaning, the kingdom of heaven is near. It's beginning, it's starting, it's close to you. It's been inaugurated. And it will continue. That's why when Jesus taught his disciples, he told them to pray, thy kingdom come. Jesus wanted them to be part of God's beginning of his kingdom. And as our New Testament reading says, Jesus tells us that the kingdom of heaven is so precious. It is so precious that a person will sell everything they have in order to purchase that treasure. That to possess the kingdom of heaven is the greatest blessing that a person could have. Being in the kingdom is the most desirable place to be. Now, if you remember back before Christmas when we looked at, at Samuel and King Saul, and we found that the children of Israel at that time wanted a human king. And God and Samuel both said, no, no, God is your king. King Jesus is supposed to be your king. But the people said, no, we want a human king. And God allowed them to do that. And things just sort of went bad after that. The two kingdoms, the kingdom split in two, which we saw uh, in, in other parts of the story. And then today we see that those two kingdoms fell. They were conquered. And it failed. And now... God is going to turn back to what you might call his original plan with his son, Jesus, as king. But the kingdom that Jesus was going to establish wasn't, wasn't like the Roman Empire or the kingdom of France in the 15th century or the kingdom of Saudi Arabia today, no. In fact, Jesus himself says that my kingdom is not of this world because if it was, my followers would fight. And you don't see them fighting the Romans. Because that was not the purpose of the kingdom at that point in time. No, the beginning of the kingdom is where the reign of God is in control, directs the lives of the children of God, the followers of Jesus. The beginning of the kingdom of God is the reign of God in the lives of His children. The reign of God in the lives of His children, or His subjects, us, is to change people who obediently follow the king so that they become more and more like the king, King Jesus. The reign of God is expressed in the lives of those who obediently follow the king, not in some governmental or national entity. The foundation of the kingdom is that the king, Jesus Christ, died on the cross to save us from our sins. And not only that, because of him, we have eternal life. We can look forward to a resurrection and life eternal with Him because He died for our sins. Furthermore, the kingdom doesn't expand through uh, conquest or through annexation. It expands one life at a time. One life at a time, one step at a time. One life at a time and then another life and another and another. See, the early Christians, like the disciples, John and James and Peter and the Apostle Paul, they were the ones who went to Jerusalem and Ephesus and Athens and Rome, and they lived differently. They lived their life differently, and they proclaimed that gospel 
of salvation and forgiveness of sins in Jesus Christ. And what's more, they tangibly love their neighbors. They showed concern and they helped their neighbors instead of showing indifference and hatred, which pretty much everybody else around them was doing. They loved their enemies as well. They loved them in tangible ways too. Like, you remember the story from, from Acts when, when Paul was shipwrecked on Malta and how he helped to save the Roman soldiers that, that were technically his enemies. And he loved them in a tangible way. So by the power of the Holy Spirit, these people came to accept Christ and the kingdom advanced one life at a time. Now, in the end of the beginning, if you will, Jesus himself will return and he'll complete his kingdom. And we find an account of this in the book of Revelation. Oftentimes people think that, that there's nothing more to the kingdom than Jesus' ministry on earth and the ministry of the church and up to the time of Jesus' return and then it's over. But when Jesus returns, he'll actually complete his kingdom. And the new heaven and the new earth will truly reflect the prayer that Jesus taught us, which says, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so that's the point in time where that prayer will be completed. That's when Jesus will be the only civil and military and governmental and royal authority that there is. And he will then be what people thought so long ago the Messiah ought to be. Only much, much more. That's the time when the reign of God will abound. And not just in the lives of the righteous remnant, but in everyone's lives. Because those who have rejected him won't be around anymore. It will only be those who worship him and praise him. And it will be a blissful and wonderful experience. But... We're not there yet. And until we get there, we are called to obediently serve the king in our own little corner of the kingdom. And that's where we are right now. We are in our own little corner of the kingdom. At this moment, as I said, at the, at the intersection of Stones Crossing and 135, we are in, still in the beginning, the establishment of the kingdom. And we're still part of that establishment phase. And when Jesus returns, He'll complete that. And in eternity, we will enjoy the reign of God completely. But right now, we're still in the beginning. We are part of God establishing that thing. Now, you may not be aware of it, but God is doing that right here, right now. And you may not always be able to see it because of the way life goes, in, as busy as our lives are. But sometimes when you just sort of step back and take a look at what goes on in this church, you will notice that God is truly building His kingdom one life at a time. And one of the ways God does that is what we're doing right here, right now, through our worship service. Every Sunday, we offer a worship service that brings glory to God's name. And during the week, there are home groups and small groups that also actively participate in worshiping God through music and Bible study and all sorts of other things. Another way that God is using you to change lives is through our children and youth ministry right here in this place. The winter retreat that our students went on a couple of weeks ago was a, an opportunity and an experience for them to have their lives changed. Our youth groups that meet every week are opportunities for another life to be changed. Our Sunday school classes for children and students, our VBS in the summer, those are all places where the lives of our children are changed one step at a time, one piece at a time. And sometimes you don't always see that in the moment. You know, when I came here, we had a program called Awana. And Awana is a Bible memorization program. And to this day, I see kids that were part of that program out in the community or in my kids' school. And... I still see them walking with the Lord. Those are kids whose lives have been changed because of what you all did through that program here. And sometimes you have the opportunity to see it actually all come together. And a couple of weeks ago, we had that opportunity because we experienced the baptism of one of our students who had participated in, in Sunday school and youth groups and, and other opportunities that this church had offered 
for ministry. And in her decision to be baptized, we saw the fruit of all of those programs coming together. Well, also in our little corner of the kingdom, the Holy Spirit is advancing His kingdom through Bible studies. And we have a number of those that go on during the week. There's the the Beth Moore study that meets on Tuesday morning and Tuesday evening. There's the precept classes, the mom-to-mom group, and the emerging journey class. All of them help adults become more like Jesus one step at a time as they change lives one life at a time. But there's more. Another way that we are obedient in this little corner of the kingdom is through our finances. And that's a way you don't really think about very often. But let's face it. If people don't give money to the church, and if our leaders don't handle that money well, this place isn't going to be here for very much longer, right? But they do. This church gives abundantly and generously to the ministries that are, exist here. And our leaders, our finance people, our elders, our staff, do a great job of being good stewards of that money. And because of that, all those programs that I have just mentioned have a building that's well-maintained and a place where those ministries can nurture and can be nurtured and thrive. And finally, in our little corner of the kingdom, this church is being used by the Holy Spirit in missions. And as I said in my centering article, missions is part of the DNA of this church. Local missions through things like the refuge and the um, shepherd community ministry and Wheeler Mission and Habitat for Humanity, all of those things are ways that this church serves the community locally. Nationally, you support things like JARS, the New Orleans mission trips that you've had over time, and the mission trip that we took to Peru. Those are all ways that we serve nationally and internationally. But also, there are a number of missionaries that you guys support. People like the Haspels, the Callisons, who visit us just this last August. And we had a wonderful opportunity to see what they're doing. People like the Stevens and the McDowells are also wonderful missionaries that we have the opportunity to support. I already told Mark Slaughter that wherever I go, I'm going to have him come and talk to my new church about missions, about how Center Grove does missions. And I'm guessing Mark is probably hoping right about now that that church is in Florida and not Minnesota. (laughs) And I have every belief that all of these things that I've just mentioned will continue and will thrive when you make the transition from Center Grove Presbyterian Church, PCUSA, to Center Grove Church, Christian Reformed Church in North America. I believe the Holy Spirit will continue to bless you and will continue to use you to bring glory to the kingdom right here in your own little corner of the kingdom. So when we think about the fall of the kingdom of Judah and the kingdom of Israel, and we remember that Jesus has established the kingdom of heaven, and we are part of that kingdom, and that we are serving right here in our own little corner of the kingdom, and the Holy Spirit is using us to advance the kingdom here and now, one life at a time, we realize that it truly is a blessing to obediently serve the King. Would you join me in prayer?